church. I'm particular, very particular about music, music in the church. It needs and not just the music, but the musician who is doing the music. And I love that song. But the problem is, is the, the one who made that song hugely popular has apostatized. Yeah. He has yeah. left the Christian faith and now is a practicing homosexual. Yeah. I thought he wrote it, so I put it away. And then literally forcing myself not to sing that song. That song has been our theme song for 26 years. And so last night, I'm, I'm, I'll get around the barn here. We'll get there. So last night, I was sitting on the couch, and YouTube popped up. And the, the video was, was an interview mm -hmm. with the man who actually wrote that song. Yep. And I went, oh. Mm -hmm. The other fella didn't write it. Nope. He just sang it all over the country and made it hugely popular. Yes, it did. So I'm like, I'm I mean, I was like, I'm going to watch that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it, it was all about the life circumstances that caused him to write that. And church, I'm telling you, the reason I love the old hymns is because of the stories behind them. Yeah. Number one. Number two, there's Bible doctrine in those old songs. That's right. 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 And so this, this man was sitting there, and he talked about his wife that had two miscarriages and how brokenhearted they were. Mm -hmm. She'd gotten pregnant again for the third time. And she had had some, I don't know, pains or something and went to the hospital. And he said, I knew when I answered the phone that it wasn't good. And his wife told him, you need to get to the hospital right now. So he went. He said, I walked in the room. And there laid on a pillow was my 16-week-old son. He had miscarried. Oh. He said he was about the size of my hand. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they were extremely brokenhearted again. But he said, you know, I just, he's a, he was a pastor then. I'm not sure. I don't think he is now. I don't remember. But he said, I took a six month sabbatical from my church. And I just spent some time with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And when he originally wrote that song, it was 12 minutes long. Yes. 12 minutes long. Just pouring his heart out to God. Mm -hmm. And when that particular fellow that popularized it got a hold of it, he number one shortened it, <coughs> obviously. And he put the he put the bridge in it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's my favorite part. Because if we're all honest, that's where we're all at. I've been young, but brought a whole new depth to that song and, and knowing he wrote it and the story behind it, I'm going to start singing that again. That, that has become even more precious to me. But I had to wait till after the song to tell you the story behind it because I couldn't get through it. Almost didn't anyway. When he, when he talked about holding his dreams in his hand. He's talking about a 16-week-old baby boy. Mm -hmm. That very shortly after that, after he held him, was in heaven. But one thing I appreciated about him was, at the very least, he's still singing for God. I don't know, he didn't, I don't remember if he said in the video if he was still a pastor or not, but I hope so. What a testimony. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I guess for me today it's going to be one of those emotional kind of days. And that's okay. God 
okay to see the motion. As long as we don't let them run us. Philippians chapter 3. In the first, first part of the chapter, the Apostle Paul is doing what many have called, he's giving his pedigree. And he's not bragging, but there were people in the church at Philippi that were, I guess you would say, challenging his authority. And so basically what he's saying is, look, you 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 think you're you're the you're all the stuff. Well, let me tell you about me. Here's where I've been. As a Hebrew, I was a Hebrew of Hebrew. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. In, in, uh, in another scripture he talked about, he was shipwrecked. He was in the water, floating on boards like the, the rest of them. I mean, the Apostle Paul was a man's man. The church today probably would not like the Apostle Paul, truthfully. But he was a man who loved God with all of his heart, served him with everything that he had, and he lists for us his pedigree there in the first six verses. And then let's, let's find our place in verse 7. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Remember, he just talked about who he is and what he is. But he says, all these things, they're, they're nothing compared to the fact if I could win the Lord Jesus Christ. If I could be like Christ is what he's saying. Verse 8, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark the, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you for the privilege to be back in your house on the first day of 2023. Father, I, I pray that this would be the beginning of the year that we honor you we glorify you, we praise you, and most importantly, that we please you. So, Father, I need your help this morning. I'm not able to do this in and of myself. Precious Holy Ghost of God, I pray that you would fill me afresh, anoint me, touch my lips, help me to preach exactly what you want me to preach, and let me leave my part off. What you accomplished today will give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Philippians chapter 3 has been very special to me over the years, in the last several years, and I've told you all the story about asking God why, why, and he gave me Philippians 3 and verse 10. And the other day I was just, I was thinking, sometimes that's dangerous, but sometimes it works out okay. I was thinking about some of those trite little sayings that we use as Christians. And, uh, and so that's today's outline. I, I, I began, I wrote two or three of those down on a piece of paper. And then I began to think about different passages of scripture. And the tail end of what we read here today came immediately to mind. The church today, if I was to, if I was to put a title on the message, I would title it, Press On. Press on. Just because we're 2023 now, doesn't there's no time for us to slow down. 
There's no time for us to give up our responsibility. Even more so now, we need to be fulfilling the responsibilities that the Lord Jesus has given us as his church. And we, church, we owe it to him to be faithful and do what he's called us to do. I mean, he went to Calvary. He did not bat an eye. He said, no man take my life. I lay it down. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. He did it on purpose. He went to Calvary on purpose to pay our sin debt. Yes, he did. In comparison to his sacrifice, what he asked you and I to do is nothing, really. But yet our, our flesh gets in the way. And we think that, oh, it's going to kill me to do that. It won't. I promise. <coughs> but oh, the eternal reward. So many times over the course of my ministry, I've talked to people who, who I call used to be Christians. The ones that break my heart the most is, well, I used to be a pastor. No, you still are, because the Bible tells us the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. <clears throat> if he calls you to be a pastor, to be a preacher, to be an evangelist, you are a God-called man, no matter whether you sit down like Balaam's donkey or not. Mm -hmm. It's whether you're in or out of the will of God for your life. That's true. And so, church, this morning, I want to just exhort us to... Press on. Look with me again at verses 7, 8, and 9. The Apostle Paul tells us, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness. Church, this morning, we need to be on purpose working to turn our trials into triumphs. That's right. We must turn our trials into triumphs. Why? Because there's a lost and dying world out there that are watching us. Yes, they One are. time I remember my cousin was just joking around with me and he said, it's like you fell into a lens grinder and made a spectacle of yourself. You get that on the way home. We are being watched under the world's microscope. Yes, sir. You see, as much as they ill treat us and try to trip us up, they really want to see us succeed. You know why? Because what they're doing is not working. That's right. They're dying to find something that works. Yes, sir. And guess what? The Lord Jesus Christ works every time, for lack Amen. of a better term. Amen. So we need to turn our trials into triumphs. I was thinking this morning, actually I was going to, I was wanted to sing another song, and the Lord changed that all up last night. But because of time, we won't turn there. But in Genesis chapter 22, the first 14 verses, a familiar uh, account in the scripture where Abraham was told by God to offer Isaac on the mountain. That's right. Can you imagine getting that request, that directive from Jehovah? I want you to take your son, your only son. I want you to go to a mountain that I will tell you in the future, and I want you to sacrifice him. What? Mm -hmm. You want me to do what? He's my only son. What did Abraham do? Abraham turned his trial into a trial. Yes, he did. Because of his faithfulness. Yes, sir. And God rewarded that faithfulness. Yes, sir, he did. And I know when 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 uh, when it tells us in Genesis that as he began to sacrifice Isaac and the angel stopped him, mm -hmm. and the Bible tells us that God pro will provide himself. Turned his trial into a trial. Amen. How about you, church? 
We all go through trials. By the way, uh, test in, in Genesis chapter 22 there was talking about the Lord tested Abraham. Remember, God doesn't, it's, it's the, it says God tempted Abraham. He's not tempting him to do evil. He's not soliciting him to do evil. He's testing him. He's proving him. God knew and understood how Abraham would respond, but Abraham didn't know. And so God was showing Abraham, if you will trust me, if you will rely on me, this is what we can do together. Same thing for El Bethel Baptist Church in 2023. Yes, sir. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we have the man of God, Elisha, and his servant. And, and there, the servant looks up at the hills and he says, everywhere. What are we going to do? I bet his knees begin to knock. He was in a test like he had not been tested before, I believe. What did the man of God do? He encouraged him. Mm -hmm. He said, there's more with us than there are with him. Take another look. And the servant looked around. And what did he see? He saw the host of heaven ready to go to war. That's right. See what happened? <laughs> Their trial was turned into a trial. Yes, it did. By the way, church, what he did for them, he'll do for you. Yes, he will. Secondly, we need to turn our obstacles into opportunities. Turn our obstacles into opportunities. Yes, sir. That's where I struggle. It's like, Lord, I can't go any other way. I can't, I'm stuck. Help me. And he's going, But Lord, the door needs to open. Go a different way. When one door closes, another door is going to open someplace else. We need to take our we need to take these obstacles and turn them into opportunities. Look at verse 10. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul wanted to be more like Christ. Amen. And he's longing for the day that he could be resurrected again like Christ was resurrected. By the way, you, you understand that because Christ was resurrected, we're going to be resurrected one day. Yes, sir. He, was, he was the first proof. He was the proof that, hey, I'm going to set the example for you, church. I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to raise from the dead. I'm going home to be with the Father. I'm going to rule and reign. And one day you are going to do the same. But while we're here, church, we've got to turn obstacles into opportunities. In Acts chapter 7, verses 57 to 59, we see the martyr Stephen being stoned. He didn't fuss, cuss, and discuss. What did he do? As he was being stoned, he prayed. Yes, he did. Right. And they said, my soul, his face shone like an angel. And he saw the heavens open. Why? Because he didn't let the obstacle of giving his life for Christ to deter him from loving God, from serving him, from right. being faithful to the end. That's right. Amen. He could have said, hey, y'all going to throw rocks on? I'm, no, I don't know who this Jesus guy is. But he didn't. He turned his obstacle of being killed for the cause of Christ into an opportunity to continue to be a faithful martyr for Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. How about Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, verse 25? I love preaching that passage. Revival at midnight. Yep. Paul and Silas in the prison, and we all know the we know the account. Mm -hmm. They're in a they're in a prison. They're chained up, and, and it wasn't prison like today. Mm -hmm. 
I've preached at the State Farm. I've seen some of the accommodations they have, and that's the Hilton compared to what these men were. Yeah, were doing. <clears throat> They're chained up, and what happens? Paul says, Silas, you want to start or you want me to? He said, oh, go ahead. I'll just chime in with you. And what do they do? They, they begin to sing. Yeah. They begin to sing the praises of God, and what happens? I believe God, the Holy Ghost, grabbed a hold of that prison and shook that thing. Yeah. Why? Because the doors flew open. People were awake. The jailer probably said, Elizabeth, honey, I'm coming to be with you. <laughs> Paul and Silas turned a prison sentence into a praise service. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. What about me? Am I going to be poor, pitiful Patty Powder? Or am I going to say, thank you, Jesus, for the miracle, right. yes. the suffering, That's right. the overcome? Yes. We need to turn trials into triumphs. We need to turn our obstacles into opportunities. Thirdly, we need to turn our tests into testimonies. Yes, sir. Our tests into testimonies. Verse 13 says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Yes, sir. When I read that, my mind immediately went back to Amen. Daniel chapter 3. Amen. Those three Hebrew boys. Mm -hmm. Man, look what they went through. I wonder what they thought when the king brought down those decrees. Was it was there any discussion between what are we gonna do, boys? I don't think so. No. I think they said not going across it. it cost them. Boy, did it cost them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole country knew what was going on. Yes, they did. The decree was made. Mm -hmm. And as they stood, I believe stood bound at the entrance to the fiery furnace, and the king gave them one more opportunity, one more chance, to recant. Maybe he did. They said, O king, our God is able. Yes, he is. If it's his will to let us perish, we perish. Mm -hmm. But if it's his will for us to triumph, we're going out of here. That's right, amen. Yes, sir. And by the way, it could be by life or by death. Mm -hmm. Death for a child of God is a promotion. Yes. And so those three men were cast. That doesn't mean they were just, you know, like pushed in there. No, I mean they got a hold of them. It's kind of like putting a bad guy in the back of a jail wagon. You know, you don't just go down, get in there, little fella. No, you put them in there with a little bit of a force. Usually there's a big thud involved. Yeah. Cast them into the burning fire of furnace. You know what? There was one already there. Yes, sir. And he was waiting. Yes, he was. Where you been, boys? I've been waiting on you. And they looked in there and they said, Oh, King, you ain't going to believe this one. And the king said, didn't we throw three of them in there? Uh-huh. Behold, I see four men, unhurt, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. Yep. And that fourth one, he looks like the son of God. Yes. 
because he's what? Amen. Amen. He willingly walked with us through the fiery trials of life. And one of the greatest things I believe in the account of those three Hebrew men was when they brought them out. The Bible says that not even the smell of smoke transferred to their garments. I love a good fire. It smelled like it for hours afterwards. I bet they did too. But I don't smell anything. You smell anything? Mm -mm. Why? Because there wasn't anything that could touch them because they were right in the middle of the will of God for their lives. And they turned their trials into triumph. They turned those obstacles into opportunities. They turned their test into a, an incredible testimony. So much so that even, even to the days of the Magi who came to Christ when he was born, came so because we believe of the influence of Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishio. All those years later, his influence was carrying on. Why? Because of exactly what we're talking about here today. Amen. Those men loved God, served him with all of their heart. They continued what? They began to they continued to press on, press on, press on. When Paul was talking about pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, that's an athletic term. We've all probably watched the Olympics, right? Oh, yeah. When they when they run and run through that tape, do they do they just kind of <laughs> No, what do they do? They streamline themselves, they push that big old chest out there. Why? They're trying to they're trying to break the plane first. That's the picture that the Apostle Paul is giving us. When we are pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, he's saying, get it all you got, church. That's right. Press on. Amen. We can't back up, pack up, slack up, or shut up. Church, we've got to stand up, stand out, speak up, and speak out in 2023 for the cause of Christ. Amen. Amen. How many of you have heard much about George Mueller? George Mueller, very well known because of his orphanages mm -hmm. and how he trusted God. He would gather the children at the breakfast table knowing there was zero food in the house, in the orphanage. That's right. They would sit down at the table and they would thank God for the breakfast that they were about to receive. Mm -hmm. Nothing in the orphanage to yeah. eat. And then all of a sudden, come a knock at the door. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mueller, the, the wheel on my milk wagon broke. Uh, could, could the orphanage use some milk? Yes. Come a knock on the door. Mr. Mueller, I, I baked this bread and, and there's been something happened at the bakery. I can't remain open. Could the orphanage use some bread? Yeah. yeah. Time after time after time, God answered that man's prayer. Yes, sir, he did. Sometimes instantly. But you know something? Even as the great prayer warrior that George Mueller was, God did not always immediately answer his prayer. George Mueller had four friends. They were not saved. And he committed to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And he began to pray for them. Shortly after he began to pray for them, one of his friends came and trusted Christ as his Savior. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, sometime later, his second friend trusted Christ as his Savior. And then a good deal later, his third friend trusted Christ as his Savior. But that fourth friend, just wouldn't <coughs> repent and trust Christ. But Mr. Mueller never Good. stopped praying for him. Yeah. Never. That's true. Friend number four did finally get saved. Mm -hmm. Pressed on 
Amen. And you pray. That's right. The Lord's praying. He never gives up. Amen. God said, I'm not going to answer this in your time. It's going to be in my time. Mm -hmm. Jesus comes back to take us home to be with him. I pray that he finds every one of us, every member of the Bethel Baptist Church, faithfully pressing on to the end. Amen. Even till the end. That's right. Stand to our feet this morning. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Father, thank you for this reminder in your word this morning. Father, I